기회를 해드리도록 하겠습니다. 허준민 교수님께 박수 한번 부탁드리겠습니다. 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. 저는 짧게 소개만 드리고 내려갈 거고요. 오늘 발표를 맡아주신 스카이 클레머 교수님을 소개해 드립니다. 그러니까 스카이 클레머 교수님은 지금 UC 샌디에고에서 어, 어, 디자인 랩에 있는 코파운더, 코 디렉터로 계시고요. 그 다음에 여러분들께서 UCSD의 디자인 랩은 돈 노만이 처음, 그러니까 처음 세우신 랩이에요. 굉장히 익숙한 랩이시고요. 그 다음에 굉장히 활발하게 많은 활동을 하고 있고 아시다시피 샌디에고는 퀄컴이라든가 많은 기업들이 있어서 우리가 아는 실리콘밸리랑은 다르게 굉장히 많은 창업들이 일어나고 있고 그 플랫폼과 연관한 어, 연구도 굉장히 많이 하고 계십니다. 스카콜 클레머 교수님은 UC 버클리에서 학위를 마치신 다음에 2004년부터 스탠포드 쪽에서 굉장히 많이 올한 9년, 아, 8년 정도 있으셨고요. 어, HCL 그룹 공동 지도와 그 다음에 디스크를 설립에도 관여하셨고 인터랙션 관련한 온라인 강의도 활발하게 진행하고 계시는데 지금까지 수강한 총 인원수가 20만 명 정도 돼요. 그래서 굉장히 여러분들께서 뭐 많은 그리고 실질적인 강의를 들으실 수 있을 것 같습니다. 저는 이 정도에서 물러나고요. 스카 클레머 교수님을 소개 드립니다. 쇼린 스카입니다. And <laughs> thank you so much to Uni and Isu and the prestigious members of the organizing committee for bringing me here today. And thank you so much to all of you for joining me here today. This is a, a tremendous honor for me to be here with all of you, given all of the innovation that I've seen in the exhibition hall and around the conference. And I wanted to talk a little bit with you today uh, about a way that I think that design is changing. And the changes that we're seeing are what I call design at large. And this idea of design at large is a little bit like, uh, you know, in the 1990s, when we did human-centered design, or lots of science, it was like living in a fishbowl, that we had our research laboratory, and we would try things out with a small number of people. And once we released our software, uh, we had no idea what happened to it. If I was even Microsoft and I ship a CD-ROM, a large volume piece of software, I don't know what users did with it. And the way that we got software ready for release is that we would get software till it was mostly working. And then we would bring somebody into our lab, bring somebody into our fishbowl. And we would try it with them, and they would use the software, and at one point, they would get stuck, and maybe they would swear. So we would take our clipboard, and we would write down where they get stuck, and then we would iterate it a little bit. But again, once we released it, we had no idea what anybody did. Now, design at large is, is different. I come today uh, from San Diego, uh, where I go swimming in the ocean. And uh, the ocean is very different than the fishbowl. I moved to San Diego three years ago and started swimming in the ocean, and it's amazing all of the things you see. It's so different. Design is like that right now, where we have this opportunity to be able to try out our software and be able to release even early prototypes, even projects by design students we can put online, we can release to the world, and we can see how things go. The world is a diverse place, different people use things differently, people use things in unexpected ways, and because of software as a service, because of the web, we have the opportunity to iterate and improve and experiment with what we're doing. And in my talk today, I'd like to give some examples of this. A lot of the examples that I'll use come from uh, students' work from my research group. I've been fortunate to have advised a number of really talented graduate students, some of whom have gone on to found companies like Instagram or Pulse, and I'll talk about some of their experiences. 
Uh, so this is Mike. Mike Krieger was a student of mine at Stanford. We worked together for five years. Uh, and he co-founded uh, a, uh, a company called Instagram. I'm curious, how many people have used Instagram, the photo application? Okay, great. Um, what you may not know is that Instagram was Mike and Kevin's second company. And I'd like to talk a little bit about their first company. Their first company uh, was called Bourbon. This is a screenshot of it. Like Instagram, it was also a photo sharing company. But it didn't work very well. So Mike, Mike and Kevin thought, well, photos are personal, so everything needs to be private. And only your friends would want to know what you're doing. And Mike and Kevin thought of Instagram like a check-in service, like Foursquare or Yelp. And lastly, Mike and Kevin thought, to get people to use this, we'll need to make it like a game. None of these turned out to be true. So they tried a second startup. This is the power of prototyping. With Instagram, as opposed to having friends, they had things be followers. And in fact, Mike always assumed that Instagram would have a friend model like Facebook. But to get their prototype out quickly, they just had it be open to everybody. And then they saw the power of being able to follow people from Hawaii and from Seoul and from all of the different places that are interesting around the world. And this made it a photo-driven application. Also, Mike brought all of this into the Instagram app. And as opposed to having things be a game, what makes things compelling for Instagram is the community. Instagram has more than 400 million active users, 10 times the population of Korea, almost. They had more signups in the first hour of Instagram, one hour they turned the key on, than in all of their history. And so what this tells me is that even extremely talented and creative people, their first idea isn't always their best idea and that iteration and prototyping transform mediocre ideas into great ones. This is a, a second example. Uh, this is my, my student Akshay Kotari's work. Um, when Steve Jobs announced the iPad, Akshay said, this will be a great device for reading. And so he and uh, his friend Ankit started making prototypes of what the reading experience on an iPad might be. Here you can see some of the sketches. And I like to show these sketches because um, they aren't beautiful. This isn't the, you know, I was originally trained as a, a graphic designer at the Rhode Island School of, of Design. Uh, and this was not the, these aren't the beautiful, perfect lettered sketches. This is quick and dirty and fast sketches. It's about communication, not visual perfection. And so uh, Pulse now uh, was acquired by LinkedIn, and Akshay leads a team of people for software that's used by more than half a billion people worldwide. And again, these ideas came through iteration and evolution. They made so many different sketches. Akshay tells me they made 50 different prototypes that they tried out with users. And having all of those things uh, was extremely important. And this idea of trying out lots of different things, I would like to show a few more examples of. On the left, um, this is a, a photograph from the, the um, late 1980s, when Microsoft was releasing its first computer 
that had a mouse. When something is new, we have lots of questions. How many buttons should a mouse have? Should they be the same size? Should the mouse be round or square? Should it be ergonomic or uh, clean and modern? Um, gosh, should it be big or small, bumpy or curvy? All of these different questions. When I see all of these mice, what I see are questions that a designer is asking. You know, humans, we speak in language. Designers, designers speak in prototypes. And uh, here's another example I really like. Um, the, in a, there was a meeting that, that Denny Boyle was running where they were working on a surgical, a medical surgical device. And they were talking with the surgeons. And Denny says, oh, you mean something like this. And he grabs the whiteboard marker from the, the, the wall and he tapes it to this other stuff. This was a very fast prototype, and it's the way that designers communicate. He communicated this idea to the users with this prototype, and that became the surgical device that's sold today that you see below. Prototypes are questions. People often ask me about what is design. And my favorite definition of design uh, comes from the, the famous uh, cognitive scientist, Herb Simon. And Herb said, "Design everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at transforming existing situations into preferred ones. I think this is a very optimistic view. And because of that, I think experimentation, trial and error, is extremely important because our beliefs are often wrong. Here's an example. I'm going to tell you a story of a product that sold 8 million units in its first year and it started out as a block of wood. You probably know this. This is uh, the Palm Pilot. And I was so impressed by the palm as a, as a design uh, object because it, it was very difficult in the mid-90s when this came out to think about how could we have a computer, the computer, it sits on our desk, it's big, how can you have a computer that fits in your pocket? Today those answers seem obvious, but at the time it wasn't. Palm was founded uh, by someone named Jeff Hawkins. And the way that Jeff figured out how we can have a computer that fits in our pocket was he created a block of wood. And this is an actual photograph from the Computer History Museum in California. This is Jeff's block of wood. He went to his shop, he cut a piece of plywood, and then he printed out different interface screens on top of it. And he would imagine in his head, he would go to a meeting, you know, we have lunch together, we have a meeting. He would imagine that this was a real device, that it really worked. And he would try things like make a calendar appointment, or look up uh, somebody's contact information, or add something to his to-do list. And what that did successfully is that it enabled him to know what's the functionality that's the most important. Because if you're going to make a computer that's small, that fits in your pocket, it needs to have only the most important things, and you get rid of everything else. The block of wood taught that to Jeff. I like this idea of thinking about a block of wood as a computer because it reminds me of what the, the famous science fiction author, Arthur C. Clarke, said. Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And when I walk around the exhi exhibition hall today, what I see with all of the advanced technologies that you're creating is a, is a kind of magic. And when I see Jeff take a block of wood and imagine that to be a computer, I see that as a kind of magic. 
And so if you have a take-home message from this talk, it's that prototypes are magic. And you, and all of us, we're the wizards that make that magic. Before the sound starts, I want to tell you a little bit about this. Um, this is one of my favorite prototyping stories. Uh, this is my office window from Stanford. And we're about to throw this out my window. Uh, it's, a, it's something made out of paper and pipe cleaners and other everyday objects. And it's going to protect this egg from a fall. Uh, I know in America, high school students and, and uh, people commonly do this. Has anybody made one of these egg drop devices? Okay, a couple. So in case you haven't, for many of you who haven't, here's what it looks like. It's really fun. And what we see is this egg, we threw it out of my office window, 40 feet up, and it survived uh, all that way. I think that's really cool. This is a very simple design project. As you can imagine, some people do much better than others. You see really good ideas and really bad ideas, all sorts of different things. What was interesting to me is we've studied people making simple designs. And I think that the mindset that we have as designers is extremely important. And what we saw here, besides creative solutions like this, was we also saw a danger that many people had when they, had, uh, when they didn't have a designer's mindset. So I'm going to show you a couple people talking. And keep in mind that everybody we, uh, we gave this problem to made very different things. People make very, very different things. And yet, when people talk about it, here's what they say. This seems to be the only idea. There needs to be a platform, and then it's going to cushion as possible with the materials. I, I, I don't see any, uh, any of that. I'm not a very good outside the box thinker, so I kind of just had one idea, and I was going to try and make it work. Um, what, what the whole parachute idea and what I had in the beginning, so. This is the best approach for such a design. So I think this is really funny, because here we have somebody with this silly cylinder 